We once caught a parking valet in Norfolk, Virginia, trying to steal clothes from the car. We beat him up right in front of the box office. I told you that Dookie was a hot boy, a rock boy, a drop boy. Stay on top, boy. Love bugs, hello there, Bellas. If you have not already done so, please remember to like, share the Facebook, subscribe, and visit uptopbeauty.com. Yes. And if you are not a part of our book club, please hit the Patreon link below and or the join button here on the YouTube. And for a small monthly fee of five dollars, you babies. Yes, you can be privy to all the shenanigans before the YouTube gets it, if the YouTube gets it. Now, let's continue talking about Duke Fakir's My Life as a Four Top. I've talked this over with Otis Williams, the last surviving member of The Temptations. That's why this book's so dry. I digress. Otis was always the leader of that group. He still is. We've talked about us both surviving both, still performing, how we've managed to stay alive. Two of the greatest singers in the original Temptations, Eddie Kendricks and David Ruffin, couldn't survive the business. In 1968, during Motown's biggest days, Eddie and David decided to leave the group. Obie and I tried to talk them out of it. We were all great friends. They each had their personal reasons. They also didn't like how the money was being split among the group. In every group, there are disciplinary rules that you have to accept. There is usually one member who sets up the rules. It's usually not democratic, but it has to be done. They felt they were big enough to make up their own rules. Ooh, girl, ooh, girl. I could tell that the Otis Williams was in your brain when you was writing this part right here. Bullshit the baker, man. I'm an equal part of this group, just like everybody else. And on the Jesus, I still don't understand why Eddie left or David Ruffin left. You're in the group. I'm the lead singer. Now, now when David Ruffin's ego got into it, yeah, you, you make it a problem. You might have to get the fuck out of here like the Bobby Brown. Oh, look, okay. you, you're messing up the group. I get it to some point, but who are you to put me out? You're not my daddy. You're not my manager. You're not none of those things. So can't no one person tell me what to do in this group. We gonna have problems. I'm gonna stay in this bitch and I'm gonna make it a problem because you can't put me out of the group. Who the fuck is you? Once the tops and the temps were on the Motown review tour together and instead of riding with everyone else, David had himself a limo, child. We were buddies and sometimes I'd ride with him. Duke, you ain't gonna say because you like to get high too? Okay, I digress. And sometimes I'd ride with him, partying, drinking, doing a little coke. Oh, okay, okay, okay. We once caught a parking valet in Norfolk, Virginia, trying to steal clothes from the car. We beat him up right in front of the box office. I told you that Dookie was a hot boy, a rock boy, a drop boy, stay on top boy. David wanted to stab him, like back in the day, gang fighting on the streets in Detroit. But I stopped him before he lost it completely. David was a good guy. He loved being around people, performing, hanging out, but as loving as he was, he had a pompous side. I called him Lord Jim because he carried himself like he was some kind of royalty. But he did it in a nice way without being totally arrogant. Eddie, on the other hand, didn't talk a lot. 
a nice, low-key, simple guy. When he was high or having fun, he was just kind of quiet. He could sing really well. He had a beautiful tenor voice. In fact, Eddie sang the tenor part for me for the recording of Bernadette when I was not feeling well. We tried to talk Eddie and David out of leaving the temptations. We loved them. They were like brothers. We'd climbed the mountain of success together. Obi and I tried to impress upon them that they had spent their whole lives working to get to this point. Are you kidding? You came from a hole in the wall and now you're world famous. We gave them all kinds of examples like they should be able to put up with any small annoyances to keep making such good money. We talked to them like preachers, like brothers, whatever we could think of. They still wouldn't listen. They both left the group. At the same time, each recording solo albums at Motown. After a year or two, their careers were in freefall. Often, if the world loves you as a member of a group, when you leave, you're just not as strong as a solo artist. Shit! You better tell her Beyonce that! <coughs> Who else, y'all? Who else left the group and soared the Teddy Pendergrass? He soared! Who else, y'all? Who else left the group and Justin Timberlake? Who else, y'all? Put it below, y'all. Who else left the group and soared past the friggin' group? Okay, uh, Dookie, you tripping today, brother. You saying all kinds of crazy shit. I can tell that your ass had a conversation with the oldest. Especially if the group keeps getting higher and higher. You're out there by yourself, left behind, all alone. David died of a cocaine overdose in 1991 when he was just 50 years old. Eddie, just a year longer. His cause of death was listed as lung cancer, but many believe that drug abuse was also a contributing factor. Yeah, I know your ass is talking to the oldest. Because T.T. said that he ain't never, ever, ever, ever seen Eddie Kendrick's do the drugs. You, yeah, I, um, I'm mad at you right now, Dookie. Lee, don't talk to him. You know how parents be like, that's not your friend. I attended the funeral in his hometown of Birmingham, Alabama, which built a beautiful park memorializing him, an earlier member of Temp's Paul William, one of its founders, died years before in 1973 when he took his life after being kicked out the group for drinking. All of the Temp's were such sweet, talented guys. Too much living, too young. We were on the road traveling, performing on stage, and slated to open at Caesars in Las Vegas when Levi got to feeling bad. Lawrence wasn't feeling well either, so we canceled. We had never worked at Caesars before, so I was a bit let down. But the guys really weren't up to it. Now, as a result of the boys not feeling well, Fakir was like, wait a minute, maybe I need to carry my ass over to the doctor just to make sure that I'm good. My doctor gave me a thorough checkup. He examined my heart and decided that some further testing was necessary. I was blown away with what the cardiologist discovered. I had a 90% blockage in two of my arteries and a 70% blockage in another one. There was no question that I needed heart surgery. Y'all, you know I'm coming up on the age that my mom died, right? Now, my mother was a smoker, but uh, the females in my family, we have a propensity to have heart problems. I mean, seriously, all the way to my great-grandma, okay? And just for you guys to know, I am doing what I need to do in order to uh, stay alive. Because, you know, my mom died very young at 52. Okay. I'm not going to lie. I do have my struggles with certain foods. Baked goods are the devil to me. For my weight, I am considered obese. Okay. So it's constantly a battle with me to stay away from this place called Just Burnt Ow, you need. But anyway, let me stay focused, okay? Um, just listen, for those of us who struggle with weight issues, you're not alone. I can eat healthy and at the same time go over there to just bunt and get 
one of them vanilla classic mini bunt cake. When things. I came to after the surgery, my pastor, Piper, and a few other people were standing around me. I opened my eyes, barely conscious, and saw tubes running everywhere. I opened my mouth, trying to make a sound. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. Duke, what is it? What are you trying to say? Someone asked. I managed to reply. I'm making sure I'm still a tenor. Negro, you are out of your mind, close to death. And the first thing you say is, can you still sing? They fell out laughing. But I was serious. If I'd come out of surgery alive and couldn't sing, man, fortunately, your vocal cords are the strongest muscle you have if you're using them. Lawrence never told us that he went to see a neurologist at this time or that his PSA level was high, an indicator of possible prostate cancer. It wasn't that he was keeping that information from us. He was in denial himself. He didn't go back for his regular checkup six months later like the doctor ordered. He tried to put it out of his mind for over a year. Meanwhile, we kept performing all over the country, a high energy grueling schedule, even when you're in good shape. We were working at the Tropicana Hotel in Atlantic City the next year, booked for the whole weekend. On Friday night, Lawrence began telling us how bad he felt. He had this boil on his butt and wanted to find a doctor to lance it. We all felt that with a little rest and being off his feet, he'd be better the next day. Instead, when we awoke, the pain was so bad, he apologized about not being able to do the show that night. We managed without him, scuffling through, apologizing to the audience, promising that Lawrence would be back again in no time. We had no idea how serious it was. By the next night, it was apparent that we couldn't finish our Tropicana engagement. Still, we thought it was just a boil, maybe infected, nothing to really worry about. Back home in Detroit, Lawrence saw his regular doctor who admitted him to the hospital. That's when we found out that he had cancer. <laughs> done so please remember to like share the facebook subscribe and visit up top beauty my wood bangle bundles because they're not selling i think i'm going to lower the price on them and then mix up the colors a bit you know i would love to keep the colors the same but i mean real talk i, I got some things i gotta do 